No, I'm going to give you all the highlights, and you should be able to get everything out of it. Um, and I'm just, it's going to say out of 30 slides, ignore that, because I'm just leaving out all the future work stuff that's part of the prospectus. <laughs> so it's really 20 slides, or 21, one of those things. Um, are, we gonna, are we good to go? Go ahead. All right, this is just like our old meetings. Um, all right, my name is Yuval Perez. I will be talking to you about the use of page information for L1 caching. Uh, my dissertation advisor is Dr. Gary Tyson. That'd be good. <laughs> uh, well, prepare to be disappointed. Um, <laughs> so one of the highlights of this work is that I'm focusing on using realistic parameters, um, using the M5 simulator in order to eventually use the full system simulation, and I'm modeling all my parameters after the Intel i7 core and the AMD X6 core to give us a little bit of um, modern processor perspective on how, the, how this whole approach can become useful. The next important thing about this work is the level of analysis on memory behavior that you will see in a minute. I have some examples on here. And as far as I could find so far, at least, I've never seen a detailed analysis quite like this. And then we're, we're going to go over the current design phase that we've gone through to change the L1 cache, and we'll leave out the future work, and you can ask me about that later after the presentation's over. So briefly going through the uh, parameters, obviously these aren't public knowledge, so I had to play around with some variables and uh, look up some uh, information online through forums and such, but this is the general consensus that I got. And the important thing to take out of this is really the latency and the size of the L1 data cache. Um, similarly here, the, the AMD uses um, smaller associativity, you notice know, 8 for the i7 and 2 for the AMD core, probably due to the fact that AMD doesn't do multi-threading on the same core, so you don't need quite the same associativity. So you can get a bigger cache and whatnot. These are the benchmarks that I've used, uh, a bunch from CPU 2006 and MediaBench. Now, I ran a couple of different, um, I guess, parameters through M5. The baseline will be given as just, you know, the 100%. Now, if we infinitely port the data cache, we see a slight improvement in the IPC, very slight, um, and we see a slight reduction in miss rate. This is really due to the ability to access something a little earlier sometimes, and then it just you managed to access it before it got evicted, so we had a slightly lower miss rate due to that. The next thing we did is bump up the data cache size to 64 megabytes while keeping the latency parameter the same. Just to see, it's just to play on things and see what happens. We found out that we get about 0.8% IPC improvement, um, and this is pretty good. This is a full system, out of order simulation, so just, just the data cache by itself gave you that improvement, and we noticed the large reduction in miss rate. And these will be important later. So using the benchmarks we saw earlier, we managed to categorize them into three categories, and you can see the number of how many benchmarks fell into each category. And we'll go over what these categories mean and exactly how they look. Cache ideal benchmarks are fairly obvious. These are benchmarks that have the ideal behavior to be cached. Prefetch ideal benchmarks are ones that usually iterate through arrays. They will. Um, any data that's brought into the cache will not stay there for very long because the next piece of data sequentially will be accessed. And there are only two of those. Combined benchmarks are ones that have behavior from both. You have some areas of uh, memory that will, once brought into the cache, will be accessed for a long time, and others that are sequentially accessed. So we're going to start off with cache ideal. And you saw here the, the bold-faced benchmark names are the ones we're going to focus on. They are the best examples, the most extreme examples, really, of these. I figured if I show you the most extreme example, you'll believe me that the rest of them are even easier to capture the behavior of. So what we see here is exactly what we talked about earlier. On the y-axis, we see the memory address. On the x-axis, we see the memory reference number. So 
you know, if we had a low enough resolution, I could tell you which memory address was the first referenced in the benchmark, and we just add a pixel as we go through. So the reason these are cache ideal is most of the lines you see are horizontal. As soon as a memory was referenced once, it will be referenced through, in this case, almost the entire duration of the benchmark. More interestingly and relative, relevant to this presentation, most of these horizontal lines are also no wider than one page. And we'll see actually a little bit later, we'll zoom in a little bit on these and get a little more detail of how much smaller than a page they are. And the problem is exactly that. We have 300 million accesses here and obviously not 300 million pixels. So we need to zoom in and so we can see the frequency horizontally of how these behave. Well, what's, the, what's this benchmark do? Um, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it runs on M5. <laughs> okay. uh, distance. Okay. I'll, I'll go through and make sure I know that for the actual yeah. perspective. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's insightful to know what it does so you can, if you see the memory. Down, what's this do? Work? Kind of <laughs> it runs to completion. It runs to completion. <laughs> 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 Are you sure? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> um, so what happens here is each one of these lines is the cumulative sum of the percent of accesses that a single page has. So the red line is the total accesses within a 10,000 memory reference window that a single page here will have. So we can see if we caught one page out of all of this, that's eight kilobytes, we could capture 35% of the total references through the entire behavior. Two pages will give us a little bit above 50 and so on and so forth. But this still leaves out something. How often does that one page change through execution? Okay, and that, that is an important thing because if it changes too frequently we're going to lose some performance due to swapping. Actually we might even do worse. So. These graphs right here show one, two, three, and four page caching. The brown line that you see stri straight across is the number of unique pages that were brought in. So in the example of the one page, lo well, and behold, it never changes. So if we caught one page, we could capture 35% of this entire benchmark's references. More than that, you see here, well, Luckily, actually, you don't see here because they overlap perfectly. This is all one page. In green, you can see 60, the total memory that references that are captured by just 16 lines. In blue, you can see it here is 32 lines. And in purple, you see 64 lines. So with this page, we can capture that entire page's behavior with just 16 lines. Um, Further, we look at two pages. Also, the top two pages never change. And 16 lines provide us almost all of the references. Next down, the top three pages never change. And we see a similar thing here. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The teal line, the, to the page swaps, not unique swaps. We see that page number four actually swaps very often with page number five. So as time goes by, page four and five switch often here. So we don't know yet through that graph how often does each one of those pages once swapped is uh, one of them might be noise. So as expected here, single page accounts for all the memory accesses. Two page, this is a set of these specific two pages. We saw also no changes in that. Same thing here. We saw dynamic changes in four pages, right? And what we see is obviously page one through three never change, but page four, there are only two unique uh, page sets, four page sets. One of them is not referenced very often. So if we could design an algorithm good enough to ignore this white noise here, we could still capture a large amount of the top four pages and provide most of the benefits. So let's move on to the next benchmark, prefetch ideal. And we can see here a lot of these diagonal lines, constant strides 
that are referenced. There are, of course, a few horizontal lines, and we saw earlier that there were two of these benchmarks in this category. The other one is much nicer than this. It actually has a considerable more, considerably more horizontal lines, but it's still dominated by these diagonal lines. So we look at the same graph, one, two, three, and four pages. How often, or how often are they useful? And as we expect, this is nothing new. We see the same lines with high references whenever we have a horizontal line. Further than that, again, nothing particularly exciting about these graphs until we get later on. What we want to focus on is trying to develop an algorithm that will capture these horizontal lines in both the unique and the non-unique page swaps. And actually, part of the future work on this that is not quite ready to be presented um, deals with adding a filter uh, using a prefetch. Constant stride prefetcher that could predict these horizontal lines could act as a filter so that these become invisible to the page caching mapping algorithm. And so far it's working really well, but you know I don't have final numbers on everything. So luckily again we can see the same thing though. The single most used page is used way more often than any other page. So again, there is potential, even in this worst performing benchmark, as long as we can just design some way of filtering all of these out. Combined, we see lower in the lower area here the stack references and the heap references coming up here. Um, very similar behavior to what we saw earlier, except for now we see a much thicker horizontal line giving us a little more potential to cache uh, pages. So let's take a look at this and we see the exact behavior we'd expect. The beginning of the execution, can, one page can capture almost all of the mem memory references and that is the thick line ends right there. We see that big drop off when a lot of the memory accesses go to the heap right here. So this becomes a little more interesting here. The single most frequent page stays the same through here until that brown line jumps up to two and then switches to a different page. That tells us it's this guy right here that truncates and then switches to another page, the other part of that thick line. But there were other lines in there. When we look at the top two pages, we see that page number two and three swap very often. We see that line right here, teal. Page when we add page three into it, we see that the fourth page still causes a lot of contention. But when we capture the top four pages in this benchmark, suddenly there are no dynamic swaps. And that tells us that for this benchmark, if we could capture four pages of memory, we could actually capture pretty much the entire behavior. Further, if we pay attention still, the green line, if we capture just 16 lines of each of those four pages, we could capture almost 90% of the total memory references for that benchmark until the behavior switches to that heap heavy behavior. So again, the same graph we saw earlier. Um, this chunk right here was before that behavior swaps, and then we have one right after, and so on and so forth. The key here is to notice that for the most part, you still have only a few very tall bars here. So there aren't that many dynamic swaps, and even when there are, they're usually phase changes. Um, so we can usually manage the, thank you. All right, so our first approach was everything in memory is LRU, right? So let's, let's build on that. Let's keep going with that. It seems to work so far. And the big thing here was data, t data table look aside buffer. In physically tagged caches, the, the DTLB is going to need to be referenced first. So DTLB maintains LRU, and nice coincidence, in our case it had 64 entries and we had 64, um, yeah, 64 kilobytes of memory in the L1 data cache for the AMD design. So what we said is, well, obviously the, the uh, most heavily accessed pages 
are going to remain near the most recently used position in the DTLB. Let's use that. Let's augment the DTLB to tell us when we're at this one of these very highly referenced pages. Whenever we reach a certain threshold in the DTLB LRU stack, we'll map the page. Now what does mapping mean? We take the standard paradigm, and this is, I wish I had this slide because I forgot to add the image. We, we take the standard paradigm of L1 instruction cache and data cache. We now subdivide that data cache further. We make it a little bit smaller, and we add little page caches in parallel. So now we have a horizontal split instead of a vertical split going from an L1 to an L2 design. In the case of the AMD processor, what we did is we took the 64 kilobyte cache shrunk it down to 32 kilobytes and said let's give it 32 let's be able to capture up to 32 pages um, this was again our very naive approach and we were able to doing that we were able to map uh, certain heavily referenced pages to these 32 pages reduce most of the conflicts and swaps now what we did is the first time we did it we said let's map it when it reaches the top 50 percent of the LRU stack it was simple, but we had a few too many swaps that we didn't like. So we said, just raise the bar a little bit. Let's do it at 37.5%, which actually is binarily simple. Um, and then we got reduced number of swaps. But that wasn't quite good enough. We saw another behavior. Heavily referenced pages are also heavily referenced continuously. So instead of using the DTLB, which also restricted us to use only um, physically tagged caches, we said, let's just remember what was the last page that we accessed, virtual page number, or physical, whatever your cache uses, and, and then just increment. Every time it's the same, we access the same page as the last one, increment a counter. We found that 50% of the time, we access the same page as before. So if we use a 16-bit saturating counter, when that counter saturates, we have 0.002% chance of mapping, making a very strict mapping rule. Now, doing that allowed us to remove most of the page caches. We were able to use now just four of them, since we didn't have to worry about a lot of swaps. And doing that allowed us to uh, cater to a broader spectrum of um, processors. So the results brought these from before, infinitely ported and 64 megabyte. Here's where it gets interesting. We split up the cache, just like before, we were able, you know, when you're able to access the instruction cache and the data cache at the same time. A horizontal split gives us virtually more porting, because now we know a cycle ahead of time which cache we're going to access, and we're accessing tiny caches, one kilobyte that are only two-way associative, so we're able to access them much quicker. So, using the LRU algorithm, we managed to get an IPC that was much better than either before because we're accessing smaller caches as well and we're accessing them in parallel so it's almost as if we combined the two and made us a faster cache access we also interestingly enough we got a slight increase in miss rate due to the swaps that we talked about earlier because of the LRU and uh, this was the early work and was only executed on the x6 configuration with media bench now when we moved up to the next uh, set up with consecutive counts, much stricter, and we're able to find these pages much faster. And in this case, we managed to bump up the IPC even further. We ran it on all of the benchmarks that you saw earlier, both configurations, and we managed to get almost the same miss rate as a 64 megabyte L1 cache because of the behavior we saw earlier. We have 21 benchmarks that are cache ideal. We can capture so many, so many references. And like I said, this is the worst behaving one. I always gave you guys the worst case example. We're able to capture so many of these references before, or sorry, in these smaller caches, faster caches, and parallel caches to give us these miss rates and overall IBC numbers. I don't know if anybody cares. I don't think I have time yet. Yeah. Uh, any questions? No, I think it's two minutes. <laughs> two questions? Or? No, two minutes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I guess we can take questions. Those. Okay. Well, All right. Thank you are presenting.